selecting projects. What projects are you going to select? And the heart of this thing is balancing the desire for applied imagination, getting good ideas into the mix with accommodating the realities of program constraints. This is AI for Leaders by AI Leaders. Practical, to the point content, helping you drive results with AI. Here's Chris and Frank. Welcome to the AI for Leaders podcast. I'm Frank Strickland. I'm Chris Whitlock. Uh, listeners, if you're consuming this podcast uh, through YouTube, uh, please subscribe to our channel, uh, give it a like, uh, leave your comments there. Uh, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts, please rate and review us. Those things help to get the word out across the national security enterprise, which increases the impact. So we appreciate your contribution in that. So Whitlock, in this episode... We are going to try to give leaders to include program managers an approach that they can take to what we think might be the first hurdle that program managers and leaders have to overcome in applying AI at scale in the national security enterprise. What, what is that issue? Uh, selecting projects. What projects are you going to select? And the heart of this thing is balancing the desire for applied imagination, getting good ideas into the mix with accommodating the realities of program constraints. And every program that we've worked around has constraints. And typically there are many more ideas than you have the ability to work. So how do you effectively approach selecting projects and initiating projects in an environment like this. Very practical. Now, just by the way, you didn't start with ideation. You started with selection. Uh, why are we against ideas? Just quick caveat on that. No, we need ideas, man. Yes, we need, we need ideas. Uh, but the rubber meets the road, not in ideas. It meets the rubber meets the road when we select certain ones for action. And any, any program, any organization, et cetera, you can only take on so much work. So the work you choose to take on and initiate is exceptionally important. And you don't want to squelch good ideas. Neither do you want a thousand flowers blooming and you got people racing all over, uh, chasing tons of different things. Yeah. Um, that's the balance that, that you need to seek as a program leader or project leader. Yeah, Chris, real quick, before we jump into the how-to, I would critique myself as a, a junior to even <clears throat> mid-career government officer. And I'm going to say this speaking to my, you know, to the government leaders out there and government officers out there. I, I don't mean any harm, but if we're just candid, the reality is that in a lot of roles in government, you can live at the conceptual level. You can work the problem at an abstract level in meetings, in bad PowerPoint charts, in email, uh, in meetings. <laughs> and, um, and I would say, as someone who really loves ideas and tends to generate five of them before my eyes open in the morning, um, I, as a junior and even mid-career government leader, I, I generated a lot of ideas uh, and, and not all of them got followed up on in a project and project is where the work gets done. So, so we're very passionate about getting work done in AI, scaling the impact and thus, how do you select? Yeah, 100%. All right. 100%. So here we go. So practical how-to. The first thing we would start with is to say you have to have the team structured and you want to have the team structured so that it's a team-based discussion and you don't have one person, one authoritarian individual or one really cynical system architect or one really, you know, wild-eyed, you know, yeah, exactly, yeah. system architect. 
that is making this decision. You you want to have a team based decision that is going to get you the diverse technical perspectives. It's going to get you the diverse personality types that are going to lead you to make the best decisions. So kind of team based decision making. Uh, where would we go from there, Chris? Regularize it. Right. Um, we have a lot of ideas. Vendors are coming in all the time. That may be a software vendor, maybe some consulting firm that has an idea. You have your own internal staff uh, in a government environment who are going to bring ideas. Some of them are very good. Right. But regularizing the review, when you have a finite amount of resources and you have a portfolio of projects, it's crucial that you regularize the review. Now, the regularity of it, uh, how episodically you have it, that can change based on the kind of work that you're running. I've been in environments where every two weeks, uh, a government group might meet and screen new potential ideas or screen the existing portfolio to kill, right? I want to I want to terminate certain items uh, from the work. They're not showing the fruit that I thought they would. Uh, I've been in others where it's closer to quarterly, and those are ten, those tend to be bigger technology programs where you just cannot afford a new idea every day and, and a bunch of people scurrying off uh, to explore that. You're trying to bring some level of regimentation and discipline in what you apply resources to and when. But regularize the reviews and have a standard that people are coming to you with as they present ideas. That would be I think the key thing from my perspective, Frank. So before we unpack that standard a little bit more, because I think our listeners want to know, okay, great, what what is that standard? Just pause here and would suggest our listeners and the leaders, just by creating a regularized review environment, you do so much for your organization culturally by doing that. Uh, I'm I'm not allowing this culture, which we know exists in programs. We've seen it before. Some of you are experiencing it right now where, ooh, uh, the person that is close to the boss, you know, that's the person that's going to get their ideas hurt. No, everyone has in the government industry team, everyone has an opportunity to have their ideas heard. Um, so you just do a tremendous amount for your organization culturally through these regularized uh, reviews of ideas. Okay, so got a regularized review. Great. What's the content that we would suggest in the regularized review? I'm going to bring an idea forward to you, Chris, as the program manager. What do you want to see in that idea? You know, I it, looking across the experiences I've had where it's been really good, uh, single page, maybe two, right? You want clarity from the people who are advocating this idea or solution, what is the specific problem they are hoping to address? And have they done some amount of spade work on the potential value to cost? Now, the value should be measured relative to your baseline performance. Hey, we currently have this percent of unidentified activity. If we implement this kind of model, we think we can generate X percent of gain, as an example. And they've got some reasonable cost uh, estimate that's there. So you can look at, at value and cost. Um, I think in that context, as a leader, you're looking at two things. What relevant benchmarks are you bringing to me? So where have we done this elsewhere or why would we have uh, this expectation on the gain and this early in the process around selecting projects, it's easy uh, to buy into hype that that gets you in a position where, well, I thought we were going to get a 50 percent gain. This is looking more like 15 um, and that does not satisfy what the program needed. You can deal with a lot of that stuff up front by scrutinizing carefully the problem and solution the value and cost proposition. And one way to test the value and cost proposition is what are your expectations around leveraging the existing architecture, hardware, software, data, and with this concept, how much change are we talking about? 
um, that becomes uh, critical. The other thing that uh, I think is a is just a good best practice is on that single slide. Who have you chatted this up with before you got here? Stakeholders. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ha have you met with system engineer? Have you met with business users or mission users to explore just preliminarily uh, what could the value of something like that be? But I think if you do those things, uh, a leader team can start to get a good sense. All right. I, I get it. I, I get the potential impact and I get the technical difficulty and cost. Let's look at this in the context of the other ideas and, and make the best decision that we can. Cool. So, Chris, those elements that you just cited, they imply that a program has some regularized performance assessment function where they are looking at performance in a data-driven way and identifying areas where they think AI might help them to get lift. In the book and in the online courses, <clears throat> We go through a set of projects. You're going to come out of the regularized review if you approve something for starting as a project. It's going to go to a project. And we would say not all projects are of the same type. In fact, we've said we think there are four project types. And so that's there in the book and or in the online courses. But you implied one of them, which is a regularized performance assessment function that helps you to get that data-driven sense of where you might get lift. Right, right. And it's, it's important when we select projects that we have some sense of the potential gain. Well, if I don't know where I am, how do I judge the potential gain? And it's, it's easy to waste resources. And yeah. if you start with this basic notion, every program environment, every office is constrained in resources. We cannot, in an unfettered way, initiate new tasks and new ideas, well-established understandings in organizational performance. The more of that crap we proliferate, the longer each one is going to take and the lower the likelihood they're going to get to the goal line. So this selection process and then winnowing the portfolio of projects over time is really crucial for a leader and then finding balance. Yes, I want imaginative ideas but they need to be realistic in the context of the current architecture, in the context of what you have to work with. Can I ba balance those realistically? And that balance, Chris, we're showing here, we have written about axioms and leader practices and cases. If you just look at the chromosomal level of, of what's in our book and what's in the courses that we teach for AI leaders, axioms, leader practices, and case examples. And there are 37 axioms. This is the first one. We've tried to make them all memorable. This one gets at that balance that you were just talking about. We call it the neither Tigger nor Eeyore. Uh, but for those who are listening and can't see the page here, our experience in leveraging multiple waves of new technology is you have to apply this twofold principle that you navigate or you strike that balance. And the first is that you want capabilities or ideas for capabilities to be contextualized to actual mission task. Yes. That specificity you were talking about with the performance data, with the architectural data, with the data that is available for model training, et cetera. But conversely, you don't want an environment that is so anti-imagination or anti-ideas for whatever reason that you impede the development of breakthrough applications. And AI has some potential to create some breakthrough applications, right? It does. And I, I think one thing leaders can do in programs, in PEOs, uh, different levels is how much innovation am I looking to see as far as a resource allocation? Right. If, you know, an extreme example would be I'm 100 percent O&M. Uh, I'm, I'm operating. I'm making donuts. I, I don't have any money applied to innovation. But the flip side is I'm and maybe I, I am a research organization. Everything I am doing or close to is something innovation oriented. I think most are going to have some blend and the project selection 
activity becomes really important. And it's important even in the innovation only environments, right? You're going to have more ideas for research and uh, curiosities than you're going to have resources to do. And putting time on that and balancing this tigger, this kind of enthusiastic uh, perspective on everything with the super conservative uh, that's what we have to do as leaders in order to get to a good portfolio that will give us yield, that will give us gains in in core performance in the systems. Awesome. So, um, Chris, this goes directly to a free offer that, that we want to give uh, to our listeners. Project where the work gets done. Uh, we have written and we teach about uh, leading AI projects to include leading the data science process. And we've looked at the practices and the processes for AI projects. And in doing that, we found that there's a gap, there's a risk in what's published out there in AI project processes. And so we have a short paper uh, that identifies that risk and can help leaders mitigate that risk. If you go to our website, AILeaders.com, there's a download right there on the front on the home page, And that paper is our gift to you uh, to help you mitigate that risk in your process implementation, in your prog uh, pro project implementation. Easy for me to say. Uh, thanks to all of you all for listening again. Uh, subscribe on YouTube, uh, like uh, this episode, share it with colleagues, uh, rate and review us on Apple and Spotify. We'll really help to get the word out. We believe there need to be tens of thousands of leaders rapidly equipped across the national security enterprise to integrate AI into major programs and to deliver results through AI projects. And by rating, reviewing, subscribing, you really help us get this word out. Uh, contact us through our website, AILeaders.com. There's a contact button there. Tell us what topics you'd like us to address in subsequent podcast episodes. Give us any feedback. We'd love to hear from you. And until then, appreciate you, my friends. Indeed. Indeed.